you know, having children, I always, I suppose too, this has been enhanced by my ill health in recent years, but I always feel that it's a privilege to spend time with my children. And I have some sense of how fast time goes. You know, I've always had a very acute sense of the finitude of existence. And so, and this is a good hint for people who have children, but with regards to your family members at all, is don't take it for granted. You know, every second you get that isn't painful, you should cherish. One of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person on the five fundamental dimensions. So for example, if you're really extroverted and you have a really introverted partner, you're going to engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you I isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say whatever you want, whenever, and the agreeable per or disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is going to find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is going to find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. It's about half a standard deviation, which is quite quite a large difference by psychological standards and so what it what that means what that means fundamentally just so you have some sense of how large an, uh, uh, an effect that is is that if you have a group of men and women and you pick out random pairs the woman is going to be more agreeable than the man 60 percent of the time so that's not an overwhelming proportion but it's a reliable and it's quite it's quite large by psychological standards so th there's the problem with agreeableness some of you have had roommates and maybe you're more orderly than your roommate. What does it mean? It means you're annoyed by mess before they are. And you don't have to be annoyed by mess much before your less orderly roommate for you to be the one that's always running around picking things up. And so actually one of the things that's emerged from the psychometric analysis is that women are slightly more orderly than men. And I suspect that has something to do with the, un, what would you call it, inequitable distribution of housework. Because even if you're, imagine that your proclivity is to be triggered by disorder 25 seconds before your partners. Well, you're going to end up, it doesn't take much difference for you to be the one that's always concerned about the mess first. So anyways, and so if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're going to regard you as like uptight and over concerned with details and and well and unwilling to relax that's for sure and they're going to regard you as well just a bloody mess and how can anyone possibly live with someone like you so another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run and we don't know what the optimal I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses and there's a bit of a problem there right because maybe an agreeable person can use a bit of a disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa right so we don't understand the optimal balance for long-term thriving in a relationship but I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits where you're different is going to constitute a chronic source of conflict here's the key to a good relationship it's not the only one but watch your person carefully 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 and whenever they do something that you would like them to do more of tell them that that was really good and mean it and it's not manipulative because if it's manipulative it won't work it's like you have to say 
wow, I'm so glad you did that. You have to be precise. Here's what you just did that I thought was great. And thought, oh boy, that's so nice that you noticed. I can't believe that you noticed. It's like, you know, you do that 20 times and the person will be like the rat that's just pushing the lever for cocaine, you know? So, but no, I'm serious. It's, it's, it's Skinner established this. B.F. Skinner noticed this a long time ago. Reward is intensely uh, useful in terms of modifying behavior. You can establish the ground rules explicitly and have a discussion about it. Are we gonna to lie to each other or not? Are we going to tell each other the truth to the degree that we can to make that an actual goal and to talk through the consequences of doing that and not doing it? And then I would also say, whenever a hiccup occurs in the relationship, maybe you don't call it out at each hiccup, you know, because you have to have a certain amount of silent tolerance in any relationship to let small infractions go. But if they repeat, my rule is three times. And it's the rule that we, I share with my wife. If something happens three times that is causing emotional upset, anger, jealousy, disappointment, resentment, frustration, any of those things, anything that you don't want to experience and that you especially don't want to experience repeatedly, then you can call it out. And if you, if you have three examples, your case is much better made than if you just have one. I would also say that when you call it out, you know, you could say, look, uh, we were at a party the other night and you were, it looked to me, I felt as if you were paying too much intense intent attention to um, Dave. Flirting going on there, that's what it looked like to me. There was some flirting going on there. And you know, that made me uncomfortable. You don't say, well, you were flirting, stop doing it. You say, well, this is how it looked. This is what it looked like to me. And here was my response. And then you want to think, and maybe I'm a damn fool and blind and jealous and stupid, and I'm misinterpreting, or maybe it was a harmless flirtation of the sort that people will engage in because it adds a little bit of spice to a social interaction. You want to find out. It's really convenient if it's the other person's fault, except that you're laden with living with that person, so it really doesn't help you anyways. But it's convenient because then they have to change. But you've got to think about this over the long run. You're going to be interacting with this person.